Right, so um, today uh, we'll carry on from, <coughs> from where we finished yesterday and I'm going to go into the section on properties and formulas. And so a few basic properties that follow from the, um, the definitions. So remember we defined f of a via uh, the Jordan form. That was one approach. So if A has a Jordan form xj, x inverse, we said f of A is x, f of j, x inverse. And we had a formula which I won't write down for f of j. Um, and the other definition was that f of A was a certain polynomial in A, where P is an interpolating polynomial to the eigenvalues and their derivatives. So from the first definition, um, I think the first property up there is clear, although the x up there is not the same as the x here, so let me call this z instead, just to be avoid confusion. So if you transform A by a similarity, the claim is that um, what you get is the same similarity applied to f of A. So f of the similarity is the similarity of f of a. Um, and that's immediate from the Jordan form definition because um, similar matrices have the same Jordan form or can be taken to have the same Jordan form. Okay, so the similarity will just pop out into the z here and, and that will be um, entirely immediate. Uh, and I guess the same from, from here if you replace um, a by any similarity, uh, the similarities will pop outside every power of A, basically because if you have x A inverse to the power K, that's the same as x A to the power K x inverse. So just that property, that basic property, will also prove the first result in, uh, from the fact that F A is a polynomial in A. Um, and the first result is useful because it means that if we want to compute f of a, we can consider computing f of a transform matrix that's of a simpler form. So if we can choose x to make x a inverse simple, say triangular, block diagonal, something like that, then uh, it, that may be a good route to get uh, f of a. And the second property says the eigenvalues of f of a R f of the eigenvalues of A. I think that's one of the uh, questions on the um, exercise sheet, in fact. Um, and uh, in fact, another th this is also easy to prove using the polynomial interpretation, amongst um, other ways. Um, and again, I suppose ultimately that boils down to the fact that if A x is lambda x implies A to the k x is lambda to the kx. So that would be the monomial case. Uh, but that's a, um, a fundamental property that follows again from, from all the definitions. But interesting point is that um, you have to be a bit careful here because f of a and a don't necessarily have the same Jordan form. So if you look here, j is in Jordan form, so it's got these Jordan blocks down the diagonal, but f of j might have fewer Jordan blocks than J. Um, a simple case, well a simple example actually, is the sine function. So if I, the sine function of A is defined to be, if, if I have that Jordan form, um, it's Z, and it's a diagonal matrix um, where the, the diagonal entries are the sine of lambda I. And sine of a complex number is plus one if real part of z is non-negative and minus one if real part of z is non-positive. 
Okay, and it, actually the sign's not defined if Z is on the imaginary axis. So the sine function, which is an important function in control theory, um, and in fact, Peter Benner will undoubtedly talk about the sine function next week. He, uh, he's, that's one of the big things he's worked on. Um, so the sine, the sine of A is, is has a diagonal matrix in the middle. So you just throw away the off-diagonal part of the Jordan form and you take the sine of each eigenvalue. Um, so sine of A has got a Jordan form with one by one blocks. Doesn't matter what the, the Jordan form of A was, all the blocks here will be one by one. So you could have one big Jordan block collapsing into N one by one Jordan blocks in that case. So um, F of A, all you can say is that it will have no more than the same number of Jordan blocks as A, but it could have a lot less. And there is a nice characterization of how the Jordan structure changes. Um, I state the result in my book, um, and it depends on F dash at the eigenvalues. So if the derivative of F is non-zero, let's say, at every eigenvalue, then the Jordan form will not change. But if the der derivative is zero at some eigenvalues, you can write down a formula for how many Jordan blocks there will be. Okay, so F dash is the key thing there. So for the matrix exponential, the derivative is never zero, therefore the Jordan form of E to the A is always the same structure as the Jordan form of A. But uh, for, the, say, the cosine function, that wouldn't be the case because the derivative could be zero. Um, block triangular is a, an important property. Um, so this is a claim that this is preserved by um, the action of a matrix function. So if I have block triangular form, let's just do the three by three case. So if I apply F to that block triangular matrix, um, so these diagonal blocks are in general uh, just arbitrary matrices. So F of that will have the same structure. In fact, what it will be is f of the diagonal blocks and then some changed off-diagonal blocks. So to take f of the block triangle matrix, you just take f of the diagonal blocks and the off-diagonal blocks will change in some way. Um, that again is clear from the polynomial definition because any polynomial of a block triangle matrix is still block triangular. Okay. So um, that triangular structure is preserved under um, forming powers of the matrix. Now what these off-diagonal blocks are is not so obvious. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but the diagonal blocks are, are easy to get. So in particular, if you have a block diagonal matrix, so if you have... Um, If D is diag DII, then F of D is just F of the diagonal blocks. That's an important special case that we'll use from time to time. Okay, so those are some um, some basic definitions. Um, some slightly more advanced properties. You could ask the question, when is f of a equal to zero? And the answer is essentially when all those interpolation conditions that define the polynomial, that give the polynomial um, that reproduces f of a, they all have to be zero. So this could be useful if you're trying to check some sort of identity. Um, you want to check if some expression is zero. Um, that would be equivalent to showing that all those derivatives um, are zero. The theory of matrix functions wouldn't be of much use unless many of the properties that hold for scalars carried over to the matrix case. So in particular, um, just to generalize the example there, if you have the sum of two, if h is f plus g, then what you'd like to say is that h of a is f of a plus g of a. Okay, we'd like that to be true because it's, it's true in the scalar case. Um, 
And this is true, and again, it's really immediate from the definitions. So the, the sum of two functions um, behaves in the way we would like. There's an example there with sine plus cos. Um, maybe a bit less obvious is composition. So if, if you have the composition of two functions, um, so if you have h of t is f of g of t, is it true that h of a is f of g of a? So what I mean is, if you just apply the basic definitions to h, is that the same as applying the definitions to g and then to f on the right-hand side here? Will you get the same answer? Okay, so it's, it's not immediately obvious that, that the answer is yes. Um, and of course, um, you have to be a bit careful because you need g of a and f of g a to actually be defined. So there's the, the possibility of, uh, of one of these terms actually not being defined, depending on the eigenstructure of a. But as long as um, everything is defined, uh, the answer is that they are the same. Um, and I think the, the easiest way to prove that is via the polynomial uh, interpolant definition of, of matrix function. So those are two things that are um, sort of obvious and you might just even wonder whether they're true. You might just assume they're true without thinking about it. A bit less obvious perhaps are these ones here. So do these identities that hold in the scalar case carry over to the matrix case? So now it's a bit less obvious because See, we've now got two different matrix functions, sine and cos, and d does the sum of those squares equal the identity? Um, and if you take the pth root and raise it to the power p, does that give you back a? And do we have the analogue of Euler's formula, e to the i a is cos a plus i sine a? So, uh, we certainly hope that these things all remain valid in the matrix case. Um, and they are valid. And I'll, So there's all sorts of different ways of proving that. I'll, I'll mention one particular one in, in a little while. Um, I'm not sure which slide it's coming on, but there's a, there's a nice way of um, dealing with those sorts of uh, questions that I'll come back to in a little, little moment. Okay. So, so far, everything that we might have hoped to be true, I'm saying is true, but there are plenty of things that uh, don't work. So yesterday I mentioned that f of a transpose is the transpose of f of a, but with the conjugate transpose, that's not in general true. It depends on f whether that's true. Uh, I can give you properties that will guarantee that. Um, it basically depends on the behavior of f on the real axis. But in general, that's not true. E to the log A is A. So why is that? Well, that's because, really just because of the way I've defined E to the log A, or defined log A. Um, my definition of log A, there's the general log and then there's the principal log. But in general, um, any solution of e to the x is a, is a log of a. So that would be the general definition of log. And yesterday we talked about the principal log, which is the unique one that has eigenvalues in a strip between minus pi and pi. Um, so the definition of log says that yes, e to the log a is a, just by definition. But if I take log of both sides, um, does that imply x is log a? Can I do that? Can I just take the log of both sides? Well, it, um, if, I'm, if I'm using log to do the principal logarithm, then the answer is clearly no. And the reason is that a is an arbitrary matrix here, but log, uh, for the principal log, has to have these eigenvalues in this strip. Okay, so I've got the strip from minus pi to pi. Uh, so the eigenvalues of log have to lie in there. The eigenvalues of a can be anywhere. So log of e to the a just cannot be equal to a in general for the principal log. Um, but clearly, it's easy to get confused here. 
So you always have to ask yourself, uh, with any of these identities, um, am, am I, does this really make sense? And generally speaking, identities involving two matrices uh, are not in general valid. So the square root of A times B is in general not the square root of A times the square root of B. And here I'm assuming the principal square root. Um, well, there's really two reasons why that's not true. One is that if A and B don't commute, then all bets are off with any relations involving A and B. Okay, if you have two matrices that don't commute, you've got no chance of any kind of relation. Even if A and B do commute, um, it's still not true in general that that equality holds. Well, it doesn't even hold in the scalar case. So a lot of these things you can just answer by thinking about the scalar case. Um, e to the A, does that equal E to the A over alpha to the alpha? If you allow complex alpha, that's not true in general. Uh, though it will be true for positive um, real alpha. And the classic one, um, which is, uh, I think, very well known, this one here. The, the exponential of a sum is not the product of the exponentials in general. Um, if you want this to hold for all t, then you, there is a nice characterization that it's true if and only if a and b commute. So that's a bit unfortunate that that doesn't hold. If it did, a lot of differential equation solving would be a lot easier. And therefore, there's loads of results in the literature on relating e to the a plus b to e to the a and e to the b. Uh, So the question is, what's the relation in general? I've got e to the a plus b, and I've got e to the a, e to the b. So there's been lots of people looking at what's the connection between these two things. So you could look at the difference, and you could do some kind of expansion of that. Um, there's the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula. There's um, all kinds of limits, trotter products. There's a, a lot of ways people have tried to relate these two things. and and to connect them. And none, of them are, none of them are very simple. So there is not a simple relationship between those two uh, matrices. Uh, but that's an interesting topic and um, uh, has, has practical implications for, for numerical methods as well, some of these schemes. OK, so lots of things can go wrong, especially if you have two matrices A and B that don't commute. Uh, let's go back to a, a nice simple case, the triangular case. So for a triangular matrix, uh, there is a nice explicit formula for a 2 by 2 triangular matrix. So um, it's clear from what we've said already that f of that triangular matrix will have f of the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So we know we're going to get f lambda 1 and f lambda 2 on the diagonal. So the only new thing on that formula is the 1, 2 element of f. How have, we, how have we got that formula? T12 times the divided difference. Uh, has, ever, has anybody not heard of divided differences before? Uh, they come up, probably first meet them in interpolation, polynomial interpolation, um, in a first numerical analysis course. Um, and it's, the definition is there, it's just the, the divided difference of f at lambda 1, lambda 2 is just the difference of f's divided by the difference of lambdas. Except if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, in which case that the limit uh, is taken and you get the derivative. Um, so how do we get that formula for the 1, 2 element? Um, anybody know how to do it? And I think there's probably many ways of doing it. Well, the first principles way is to use something we just stated earlier. F, F and A have to commute. So if I call that triangular matrix T, then T times F has to equal F times T. Here, well, here F is F of T. OK, so use the fact that the matrix and its function commute. So this is a matrix equation. And if I read off the 1, 2 elements of that equation, um, I will get, I'll do it in terms, I'll, I'll just call the elements Tij and Fij. So I'll get T11 times F12 
plus T22 times F22 equals and on the right hand side they get the same thing with F and T interchanged Let's just write this down. So I'm saying T11, T12, F11, F12, naught, F22. And I'm looking at, I think, the 1, 2 element. Uh, so that should be T12. One, 2. One, two. And that should be F12 there. So I know that um, F22, well, I know F22, I know F11. The thing I'm trying to find here is F12. I'm trying to find that number there. So I can just solve for that. So F12 will be, um, I'll take that minus that. So I've got T12 into F22 uh, minus F11. So I'm solving for this, and then that will be over T22 minus T11. Um, and this formula should be the same as that one there, which it is because TII is FI, and I've just got the signs top and bottom flipped. Okay, so I've got T12 times um, the divided difference. So that can be obtained just by this um, commutativity uh, condition. Um, so that's the 2 by 2 case. So is there any hope of a formula? for a general n by n triangular matrix. Uh, there is, but it's, it's much more complicated. So this formula has been discovered and rediscovered by several people over the years. So it's just a generalization of this formula for the 2 by 2 case. So what you've now got is um, a sum of weighted divided differences. And the sum is over all sequences of integers going from i to j. Um, so what does that mean? So it's starting to get a bit combinatoric, um, this, uh, this formula. Um, so if you were to try and find the F14 uh, element, so you need to do the sum over this set S14, so you have to take a set of all integers that go from 1 to 4. Uh, well, strictly increasing sequence starting at 1, ending at 4. So you could have 1, 4. You could have 1, 2, 3, 4. You could have 1, 2, 4. You could have 1, 3, 4. Um, are there any more sequences starting at 1, ending at 4 that I've missed there? Uh, probably not. So in this case, there would be 4 four terms in the sum for the 1, 4 element. And each one is a product of t's times some divided difference. Um, but as, the, um, as you get further away from the diagonal, you're going to get more and more terms in this sum. But in principle, I mean, that is an explicit formula. Um, so we could use it to compute f of t, but it would get rapidly um, too expensive. So there'd be exponential growth in the dimension if we were to compute f of t using that formula. The other problem with that formula is this question of how do you compute the divided difference and we've got the special case with the divided difference of when when the denominator is zero you have to interpret this as a limit and you get a derivative. So you'd have the tricky question of trying to decide when two diagonal elements of t are almost equal and whether you should treat them as equal. So that would be a subtle problem if you were to try and implement this formula. Um, so really, as far as I can see, that formula is interesting theoretically, but not something that's terribly useful practically. It's too expensive to actually evaluate because of the combinatorial, combinatorial explosion in the, in the number of terms, and it's, there's some subtleties of the numerics that would be difficult to overcome as well. But it does tell us what the um, what f of t looks like.
Right, this is something I've added to the slides since they were printed. Um, a little while ago I was saying, how, do you, how can you check, how would you prove that, for example, sine squared of A plus cos squared of A is I? So how, how could you prove that? You can certainly prove it from the basic definitions. Um, but this theorem provides, I think, another way of proving it. I, th I think the reason I didn't include the theorem originally, I hardly ever use this theorem. And I think the reason I hardly ever use it, it feels a bit like cheating to use this theorem. So I tend to try and avoid it. But it actually is worth, worth knowing. Uh, so the theorem says, if you've got a um, function f, continuously differentiable n minus 1 times on some, some s subset d of r or c, then to check whether f of a is 0, you only actually have to check, um, so whether f of a is 0 for all a, you only have to check the diagonalizable matrices to have spectrum in that set. So in other words, if we want to check this formula, which I can now write in, in the form of the theorem as that minus i is naught. If I want to check if that formula is true, I only have to check it for diagonalizable matrices. But then it's completely trivial. You see, if A is diagonalizable, with D is diag lambda i, then this formula will just become x sine squared d plus cos squared d x inverse minus i is naught. Um, and if I multiply through on the left by x inverse and on the right by x, I just get rid of the x. I, so that's the same as saying that sine squared d plus cos squared d uh, is i. And then this is just a diagonal equation, so I just need to check that sine squared lambda plus cos squared lambda is 1 for each eigenvalue lambda of d. So I just reduce it right down to the case that we know, the, the n is 1 scalar case, a complex variable. Okay. So the theorem, it just makes, the whole, makes that really quite trivial. Um, um, here there's no issue about whether f is con differentiable enough or, or, or what the set d is. Um, so that's, yeah, that's rather nice. And as I say, I, I, I tend not to use that somehow. I don't know why. Um, but it did occur to me when thinking about this again that it's, it's really worth knowing that result. Um, I think one case where I did use that theorem in my book was to prove this uh, result here by Richter. So this theorem says that the principal log has an integral expansion. So integral from 0 to 1, a minus i, and then this, this rational function of, of t. Um, so applying the theorem, um, well, basically, the theorem just tells us we only have to check this for diagonalizable matrices, which means we only have to check this for a, a complex number. And if a is a single scalar, a complex scalar, then you can just evaluate the right-hand side um, explicitly, and you'll just, you know, just check you get log A, just an elementary calculation. Whereas if you were to try and prove this theorem somehow more directly, I think it, you'd have to think a bit how to do it. Uh, but it's very easy from, from the theorem. And the, the reason the theorem at the top is true, well, it's basically because the, the diagonalizable matrices are dense in the set of all matrices. You know, the notion that you take a matrix that's not diagonalizable, so it has a non-trivial Jordan form, you can just make a tiny perturbation to A and it becomes diagonalizable. So intuitively, uh, the diagonalizable matrices are dense. So if you've proved something for diagonalizable matrices, it has to be true for all matrices. So that's a nice little result. Um, and the, the, that, that result is from Horn and Johnson's Topics and Matrix Analysis book. They, they give a, a proof of that. Okay. Any questions so far? D do feel free to shout out at any point. Uh, we started on some examples applications last time. 
Um, so I have one or two more here, so let's just carry on through that section. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, so this came about through an optom well, a professor of optometry in South Africa a few years ago published a paper on this. So he's interested in well, human eyes and, and characterizing the human visual system. Um, and I know surprisingly in some sense, the, the way they like to do this is by a five by five matrix. So you've got a special structure here. Uh, T is five by five, but in the top left hand corner, it's got this four by four symplectic S. Symplectic means that S transpose JS is J, where J is this um, anti-diagonal matrix. Okay, so S is not orthogonal, uh, but it satisfies a similar condition with, with the I replaced by the J. So symplectic matrix, um, there's a delta, vector delta in the top right, a four by one vector, and a one in the bottom. And so, in principle, they, they would characterize any visual system of a, I think a human or an animal in somehow or other by this, by this matrix. Um, and what they then want to do is to take a collection of subjects and then sort of average the, the, these, these matrices over all the subjects in the collection. So, so they'd like to say, what is the average of a set of such t matrices T? Um, but they clearly want the average to have the same structure. And if you simply take the arithmetic mean here, um, you do not get a matrix with that structure, and the reason is that the S's, uh, if you just average the S parts, you don't get a symplectic matrix. Okay, so if you take two, two matrices, S1 and S2, satisfying this equation, then S1 plus S2 over 2 will not satisfy that equation, because it's a nonlinear equation. So what, what they thought about doing was using a different mean, um, so they instead took the, the sum of the logs, um, so the arithmetic mean of the logs and then exponentiated. So that's a kind of log, um, log mean. And that's something that's natural in the context of Lie algebras. So it's not a new idea to take the mean like that. Um, but that was the, the, the idea in that paper. Um, and Bill Harris um, came to that meeting we had in Manchester in April. So he is, he's not from our field at all, he is in, in the area of optometry, but he's on the theoretical end and he's pretty mathematical, and uh, so he's, he's still working with these ideas. Um, and uh, he just sent me an email the last couple of days ago with a question about this. So, um, so this is an example of a highly structured problem um, coming up in an application. Um, and this, this particular mean is, is one that I've seen in lots of different contexts. So any sort of context where you've got this kind of nonlinear structure, um, this Lie algebra, Lie group structure, it's very natural to, take, to look at those kinds of means. Um, there's a whole host of different means that have been defined and th they usually involve uh, matrix functions in one way or another. So if you want to compute that mean, clearly what you want to do is um, to get log of ti, of ti, you'll have to compute log of the s part, so you'll, you'll in particular want to have a good way of computing log of the symplectic matrix. Because we've just seen from our formulae that to get log of t, because t is block triangular, you'll have to get log of s, that will be the top left hand corner. So you then get this structure problem, log of the symplectic matrix. This is a really nice application that I came across um, a little while ago. And um, it's a bit surprising, really, this, this application, because normally, whenever you can use the Cholesky factorization, you should just do it, because Cholesky is it's cheap to compute, it's numerically stable, simple to understand, easy to program. You know, the Cholesky factorization algorithm is about the best algorithm in the whole of numerical linear algebra. There's nothing, you know, it could hardly be better. So if you see an opportunity to use Cholesky, you would normally just say, great, problem solved. Um, well, is that the case here? Well, th this is a rather unusual example. We, the, the, the task here is to compute samples from a normal distribution with mean mu 
So mu is a vector, and c is a, a matrix. So the c is the, co the covariance matrix. And they're given, so you're given c and mu, but the dimension is between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 15. So these are colossal matrices, and they're very sparse. Um, and the, probably the most obvious way of doing that, that to people in, in statistics, would be to say, well, what we know how to do is generate random uh, standard normal variates. So we can get random variables from the normal 0-1 distribution, or the normal zero identity distribution. So the idea is to do that, so there are plenty of computer programs for generating the x's, uh, and if you form a Cholesky factorization of C, and then you do LX plus mu, uh, it turns out that um, the Y, which is mu plus LX, will have the desired distribution. Okay. So you first of all get your Cholesky of C, then use the L factor to multiply the standard normal variates. Um, I'll, I'll just go over that on the board, because it's, um, it's not something you see that often in the, how, why that formula works but it is quite elementary and it will explain the second part of the slide um, so we just need to recall the definition of um, of these things so y is ax plus b so the mean of y or the expectation of y um, the expectation is linear so this will be um, a times the expectation of x plus b and expectation of x is mu so that's a mu plus b okay so that's just saying the expectation um, of a linear function of x is the same function of the expectation um, so this i guess this proves that um, y has um, the right mean there, but what about the variance? That's the interesting part. So what is the variance of y? Well, the formula for the variance of y is the expectation of y minus its mean times y minus its mean transpose. This is the, you know, the definition of variance from statistics. And this will simplify when we multiply it out. Well, we need to remember that y is ax plus b, so this will simplify quite a bit. So this is the expectation of, um, so y is x plus b, so this will just be a into x minus mu. So in fact it'll be x minus mu, uh, no, a into x minus mu, and then times the transpose of that. because the B is cancelled. Um, and the A is constant, so we can take the expectation inside. So this is the same as the expectation of... No. It's A times the expectation of X minus mu, X minus mu transpose, then all times A. Oh, that should be a transpose there. So just take the A outside the expectation, that's all I'm doing there. Just take that outside. And this thing in the middle, this bit here, is just the variance of, uh, of X. That's the definition of the variance of X. So what we've shown there is that the variance of y is a variance of x, a transpose. Okay. 
And in our case, variance of x is i because x is normally distributed. So the variance is just AA transpose. So if y is x plus b with x normal naught 1, uh, the variance of y is AA transpose. Is that okay? Um, so in our case here, we've got A is L. So the variance of Y given by this formula is just LL transpose and LL transpose is C. So that, that justifies that statement in the first bullet that the Cholesky factor of C is the right matrix to put in front of X to get the, the variance we wanted. Okay. So this would all be obvious to a, a statistician and they would just say, okay, fine. Um, the problem is though, this dimension that, you know, C is of order 10 to the 12 or bigger in size. And for such a large matrix, we, we won't be able to compute the Cholesky factor. So this really isn't practical. Um, but when you think about this proof, there's lots of A's that I could take here. So my requirement is, in terms of the application, I want AA transpose to equal C. So I can take any matrix A so that AA transpose is C. The Cholesky factor is just one possible solution of that equation. But there's infinitely many solutions. And another solution is A is C to the half, the square root of C, the, 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 um, the principal square root. So if I take A is a is c to the half, I will again uh, satisfy uh, the requirement. So put the c to the half here, that will still give me the right, um, the right variance. At first sight, that's a silly thing to do, because it's much harder to compute the square root of a matrix than to compute the Cholesky factor. So at first sight, you would say that's just a theoretical observation. However, um, you see, we don't actually need the square root. What we need is the square root times a vector. And as Marlies was saying yesterday, um, this kind of problem of matrix function times a vector is very different in nature than computing the actual matrix function. And we can compute this without computing c to the half, um, for example, by Krylov methods. And for those methods, all you would have to do is form products with the matrix C. And that's about the only thing we can do here anyway. So we, we, we assume we can form c times a vector, but that's about all we can assume. We can't assume we can factorize C or do anything else. So there are methods where we can, we can compute this product purely by using products of vectors with C, in particular Krylov methods. So this is, this is now um, perfectly feasible, and this would be the best way to go. So rather than trying to use Cholesky, uh, the square root is the right uh, approach there. And this paper by um, Chen, Anitescu, and Saad um, pursues that idea. In fact, they developed some kind of special least squares approach, but they're, they're basically just using um, matrix vector products with, uh, with the matrix C. Okay. So that's a nice example. Uh, Markov problems are also uh, very good examples of the, the use of matrix functions. So Markov chains. So in a Markov chain, you've got this idea of a process jumping from state to state. It's got no memory. It doesn't remember where it was previously. But at a particular time, this matrix P gives you the probability of going from state I to state J. And um, There's an important role played by this matrix Q. So P is a stochastic matrix. It's a, a matrix of probabilities. It's got rows and column sums equal to one, all non-negative entries. And this matrix Q, whose uh, exponential times T is P, is called an intensity matrix. And it has this special structure that is non-negative with um, negative, um, it's got negative diagonal entries and non-negative off-diagonal entries 
and rho sum is equal to zero. So there's always a matrix Q so that P is e to the QT. So Q is said to generate the Markov chain um, via that formula. Okay, so that's for a continuous time Markov chain. So in the discrete version of all this, where you're just given a, a particular stochastic matrix P, the question arises, uh, can you do the same thing? Can you find a Q that has the same structure so that P is e to the Q? So when does a stochastic matrix, a matrix with um, non-negative entries and row and column sums all equal to 1, when can that be written as e to the Q for some real Q having the properties at the top there? Uh, so this is a, a question in matrix functions. And it goes back to the 1960s, and it's called the embeddability problem in Markov chains. Um, John Kingman wrote some early papers on this and posed the problem. And lots of people have worked on this problem over the years. There have been lots of papers. Some of them are specific to NH3 or NH2. Others are giving general necessary conditions or sufficient conditions. Uh, but nobody's been able to solve this problem to give a, a complete answer to that question in, in the yellow box. Uh, it's, it's a very hard problem, and the reason it's hard is that um, the answer involves non-primary logarithms, uh, as we can um, easily see by an example. So this matrix up here, this P, is a, uh, a stochastic matrix, a transition matrix. Um, X is some tiny negative number. So you can see that P is just a slight perturbation of um, a matrix with entries a third, um, in fact all these entries a third, just a small perturbation of that. And um, so P is diagonalizable and its eigenvalues are 1, X and X. In fact it's clear, if you, if you just put X is naught, then because P is just the matrix with all elements a third, in that case it would have eigenvalues 1, 0, 0. So it's not surprising that for small x, the eigenvalues are of order x, the, the non-unit ones. Um, so, x is negative, remember. So I've got one positive and two negative eigenvalues. So when I take the log of that matrix, where are those negative eigenvalues going to go? Well, log of a pure negative number um, is going to be imaginary. And if I take a principal uh, logarithm, I have to map both those x's to the same log. So they'll, they'll both go to a pure imaginary number. That means that the answer cannot have complex conjugate eigenvalues and therefore cannot be real. Okay. So let me just write that down. So this is, this is actually a very common argument that we make. So I'll just uh, make this clear. So the, okay, so the fact I'm using here is that a real matrix has complex conjugate eigenvalues. Uh, if I just regard real, real eigenvalues as a special case of complex conjugate, but they, they appear in pairs, um, lambda, lambda bar, when lambda's not real. Okay. So here I've got eigenvalues 1, x, and x. And we saw at the start of the lecture, the eigenvalues of f of a are f of the eigenvalues of a. So the eigenvalues of log of a will be log of 1, which is 0, log x, log x. So if I take the principal logarithm, I'm going to get two eigenvalues, log x. These are both pure imaginary. So I haven't got complex conjugate eigenvalues. So this, um, this is not a real matrix. So the principal log is clearly not a real matrix. So there is no principal log of P that's real, let alone stochastic. So I can't find uh, my Q by taking principal logarithms. Um, but there is a stochastic Q. Here it is, and this is a non-principal logarithm. So in this log, we've mapped the two x's to different, different logarithms, uh, log 1 and log 2. So these are, not, these are not the same number now. 
And that's what, with, no, with non-primary functions, you're allowed to do. You're allowed to map different eigenvalues to different uh, values of f. And here, you can do that getting this um, stochastic matrix. <coughs> now, we've even got a pi in here. I'm not sure where that's come from. So that's why this problem is so hard, because if you can solve it, you're going to somehow have to take into account this need sometimes to do this horrible thing with the, the mapping of the same eigenvalue to different, different uh, values of f. So that's still an open problem, the, the embeddability problem, the we characterizing when you can do this. So I'll do just a couple more slides on the Markov problem, then we'll have a break. So this is the same problem from a slightly different viewpoint. So again, we've got our transition probability matrix. But now, let's think of this in a particular situation of, um, let's say it's um, the world of finance, and we're looking at the behavior of uh, credit ratings of a company over, well, they're normally measured over six month or yearly periods. Okay, so, um, so PIJ would be the probability that the credit rating of um, jumps from or moves from I to J. So the, the columns and rows represent different credit ratings and PIJ is the probability that a company's rating will go from I to J over some time period. So over the given time period. So the matrix might be uh, labeled by credit ratings. So, you know, you, the rows and columns of the matrix are actually credit ratings, AAA, and I don't know what, how they measure these things. Whatever. You know, so when Standard & Poor's downgrade the credit rating of the UK from the, the highest one to the next lowest one, we're, we're making a move in this Markov chain uh, from one state to another. So these matrices are not huge because the, the number of credit ratings, I don't know how many it is, it's of order, you know, it's not more than 100. It's more like 10 or 15, isn't it? Um, but they're normally measured over quite long periods, six months or a year. And so what people sometimes want to know is what would the corresponding transitions be for a, a shorter period, like one month. So if we have the transition matrix for a year, P, then the corresponding matrix for one month would be the twelfth root of P. So we want the twelfth root, and we can write the twelfth root as e to the one over twelve log p, if you like. That would, you can think of that as the definition of twelfth root. So one question is: Does does p to the one over twelve have the form of a, of a stochastic matrix? Is it actually a stochastic matrix? If it is, how do we compute it? And um, if it isn't, what what should we do? Because in practice, you know, I'm working in the bank. I've been told to come up with this matrix. So I've got to come up with a matrix. And whether or not there is a stochastic 12th root is not my manager's uh, interest. He wants, he wants a matrix. So in that case, you have to think about regularizing. So you have to think about um, if, if, you can, if P to the 1 over 12 doesn't have the required structure, say it has some small negative entries, uh, you want to perturb the matrix back so it's stochastic in some sensible way. It's called regularization. And there are various ways that have been defined, uh, proposed in the literature for doing that. Um, some of them, I guess, fairly obvious, some a bit less obvious. Um, so this is what people do. They, you know, they compute roots, and if necessary, they mess with them, perturb them, um, so that they have the required properties. Um, so that's regularization. Um, I'll give you an example on the next slide. In, in credit risk rate problems, typically P is actually diagonally dominant. 
that means that the diagonal entries are big compared with the off-diagonal. Well, it, it means that AII in modulus is strictly bigger than all the other entries in the This is row diagonally dominant, so the, the ith diagonal entry is bigger than the sum of the off diagonals in that same row. Or it could be the same thing with a column emphasis. But th that kind of structure is normal in these credit rating problems. And uh, of course all that means is that you're most if you're in a particular credit rating, you will probably be in that same rating next time. So there's a lot of weight on the diagonal. There's a lot of tendency not to change credit rating from one time to the next. Um, so that's a nice property to have. Because if you want to compute these roots, then there are various iterative methods that can be proved to converge um, in, in the diagonally dominant case. So having a heavy diagonal is quite a nice thing uh, numerically. So here's, an ex here's a specific example of what I've just been saying, but in a different context. So this is uh, in, in healthcare. Um, and this is from a paper in the journal Statistics in Medicine. So this is data uh, from patients with AIDS and they're measuring every six months the, uh, which state these patients are in. So there's four AIDS-free states and one AIDS state. And so this matrix is based on this real data. So this number here means that if you're in state um, four, this is the four, four entry. Well, so if you're in state four, there's a probability of about 16% you'll be in state 5 on the next uh, time interval. Um, if you're in state 5, you'll still be in state 5 because that means you've got AIDS. So that's the six month uh, observed transition probability matrix. And the question in this paper was, what's the corresponding one month transition matrix? So can you find a sixth root of that matrix that is stochastic? Well, if you, if you compute the eigenvalues of P, here they are. The largest one will always be 1, for a stochastic matrix, of course. And we've got a single negative eigenvalue. Uh, now, that's bad news, because the same sort of argument I was just making over here, if you take um, a twelfth, well, a sixth root of this matrix, you have to take the sixth root of the eigenvalues. And this little negative eigenvalue, its sixth root is clearly not real. And so any sixth root is going to have a non-real eigenvalue that's not in a complex conjugate pair. It, can't, it therefore cannot be a real matrix. Um, so there is no sixth root of this matrix that is real, and therefore certainly not a sixth root that's stochastic. So what can you do in this case? Well, you have to regularize. So you might take the principal sixth root and perturb it to be a stochastic matrix. Uh, in fact, Lee Jing in a thesis um, has looked at this and has done a nice survey of all the different methods um, that are available for, for regularizing. Um, but I think that's an interesting problem because one way of looking at it that I don't think anybody has actually tried is to say, remember this comes from real measurements on, on people. So these numbers, well, they're quoted to four decimal places. I'm not even sure they're accurate to four decimal places. What are they measuring? Is it measurements on people are not going to be accurate to not going to be very accurate at all. So at the best, let's say they are accurate to four places. So this matrix is not really a matrix. It's really a ball of matrices. Okay, so in the space of um, n by n matrices, there is the matrix on the slide, but what we've really got is a ball of radius 10 to the minus 4. So the, the matrix we really should have got it could be anywhere in this ball. There's that level of uncertainty. So it seems to me the question you might ask is, is there some matrix in this ball that has a stochastic sixth root? Just because the particular one that we've got doesn't, doesn't mean that there isn't a matrix out here that does have a stochastic uh, sixth root. You know, and if there is, then we should, that would be a good argument for using that. So that would be a sort of optimization problem. Um, you know, over all matrices in the ball, um, find one, or find if there is one that has a stochastic sixth root, rather than just taking this one, taking a root, and then perturbing it. Okay. But um, these are hard problems. Um, 
you sort of very quickly end up in the world of nonlinear optimization when you start thinking along these lines. And, uh, but the good thing is the matrices are not huge, so we, you know, we can afford to do a lot of computation. We can do things that we wouldn't dream of doing if the matrix was a million by a million. So it's a very different world than the large sparse matrix world. Okay, so let's uh, start again. So the plan in the second part of the uh, lecture is to talk about Fresh derivatives and condition numbers. And then I'll go back to the, the, the one application I've not yet talked about. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about the Fresh derivative of a matrix function. So there's various possible notions of derivative, and if you look at the literature, um, it is possible to get a little bit confused, because, for example, people sometimes talk about having a matrix that depends on a parameter t, a scalar parameter t, um, and taking f of that, and then taking derivatives. Okay, so that would be one possible notion of derivative of a matrix function. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today, um, although that will have some relations to, uh, to today. But I'm talking about a particular derivative called the Fresher derivative. And the definition is really quite straightforward. So we've got our F mapping matrices to matrices. So the Fresher derivative L is a linear mapping from matrices to matrices, satisfying the equation in the yellow box. So you perturb x by e, and the Fresher derivative is simply the linear part of um, the perturbation expansion. Okay. Um, and it's possible to show that if this exists, um, then it's unique. And often, you can just compute this thing by um, from the definition. So if we take f of x is x squared, for example, and we look at f of x plus e minus f of x, then we get this as the, uh, as the difference between the, the original and perturbed function. Um, so the fresh derivative is the linear part of that, so the xe plus ex is our, is our derivative. And this e squared is just part of the little o norm e. Okay, so that is the fresh derivative of the function x squared. Um, and, of course, we're not assuming that x and e commute. E is an arbitrary perturbation to, uh, to x. OK, so that's the basic definition. Um, sometimes we'll put a, a subscript f on L down here to denote that it's the derivative of f. But um, it depends on context whether we need to bother doing that. OK. So that's the Frisch derivative. Um, and if, if you look in books on functional analysis, <coughs> um, they will sometimes call this the Fresher derivative. Sometimes they don't use the term Fresher, they just call it the derivative. Um, there are other types of derivative as well. There's the Gatto derivative, which is a directional derivative, uh, which has a close relation to this one. Um, but this is the one that we need to understand the sensitivity of matrix functions. And in some cases, there are some nice formulae for the derivative. So the, the, the classic one is the exponential. So the derivative of the exponential has this nice integral representation, okay, integral 0 to 1 of that product. Um, so in this case, uh, again, we can't assume in general that e to the a, that a and e commute. Um, but if A and E do commute, then this simplifies right down to either of these two expressions. Now, another way you could get a formula for the derivative, you could just say, okay, E to the A plus E minus E to the A, just write everything down, expand it, and, and take the difference. You know, so I plus A plus E plus A plus E squared over 2 factorial plus dot 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 minus <coughs> so 
So if we just expand everything in sight, um, and then expand all these powers of a plus e, uh, you end up with this formula down here. So that's another representation of the Frechet derivative of the exponential. And this is quite typical. This, so what we've got, what we've got here is basically the Frechet derivative of the um, uh, the cube function. And as you take higher and higher powers, you will get all these different products of powers of a and e in, in different orders. So these expressions rapidly become um, quite complicated. And this lack of commutativity between a and e is a bit of a nuisance sometimes. Uh, very often we're tempted, you know, we really want to simplify these, th these expressions, but we can't do because these terms do not commute. So one of the main reasons we're interested in the Frechet derivative is because it tells us about the sensitivity of the, of the matrix to perturbations. the sen sensitivity of f to perturbations in A. So what I'm interested in is I want to perturb A and compare f of the perturbed A with f of A. Um, I'd usually want to take a norm And this will only make sense if I normalize things in, in some appropriate way. So I'm usually interested in relative errors. So I would divide by the norm of f of a. I'm interested in small e. So um, if I look at the limit with norm e bounded by epsilon, and if I put an epsilon in the denominator, so limit as epsilon goes to naught, um, well, I've squashed it up a bit here. It should really be limit with the supremum. So this is now measuring the, the maximum possible change in f subject to a small change in a, in a relative sense. Okay. And so that is what I will define as the condition number of f at the, uh, the matrix A. So it's the maximum possible normwise relative change in f for a given uh, small relative normwise change in, in um, a. And I should make that relative there as well, epsilon norm A. So that's the, just the natural definition of condition number in the same way we'd, we would define it for a scalar function. So how do I get a formula for that uh, condition number? Well, this lemma says that the expression can be written as the, um, the norm of L of A times norm A over norm F of A, and the norm of L of A is this maximum here. So, so what's going on? Well, what I'm essentially doing is using the, um, the, the Frechet derivative. So F of A plus E minus f of a, from our definition, is the fresh a derivative plus little o norm e. Okay. So basically I can replace this term up here by L of a and e. So I've got the norm on the top of L a comma e. And I can ignore this little o term because I'm taking the limit as epsilon goes to naught. And the, the norm of LAE uh, divided by essentially the epsilon 
is, is what I'm de uh, defining to equal this thing here. Okay. So, so this bit of the, of the uh, formula is what gives me the L of A in, in the lemma. So that just becomes norm of L of A. And I get the other terms, norm, norm A over norm F of A left over. Okay, so that's an explicit expression for the condition number um, I just noticed a small mistake on the slide. There's a small mistake on the slide. Can anybody tell me what it is? <coughs> it's not a technical mathematical error. Mm. This cond is in Roman font. <laughs> it should be in sans serif. <laughs> um, it's because I've defined con with a math RM as I normally would in a paper, but on these Beamer slides, you need to use math SF. Right. I thought it looked a bit funny. Right. Okay, so there's the condition number. It's in given in terms of the, uh, the norm of the Frechier derivative. So if we want to estimate the condition number, uh, we can assume, well, norm A is easy to compute. We can assume we can compute or estimate norm of F of A, because we're probably computing F of A anyway. So the, the difficult part of this is going to be how to get norm of L of A. How will we estimate that? Well, before talking about practical estimation, let's look again at the case of the exponential, because in this case we have, um, we can say a little bit more. So at the top I've just re reiterated the, the, the result on the previous slide. Um, and in this, in the here, of course, if we put any particular e, we will get a lower bound for the norm. So if I put e the identity, I will get a lower bound on L of A. So, in other words, L A I over I will be a lower bound. <coughs> and if you do that for the exponential, you just end up with norm of E to the A. <coughs> so, h here the norm is any, um, any subordinate matrix norm. <coughs> so, that gives us a lower bound that the condition number is always at least norm A. So, this is specific to the exponential. The condition number of the exponential is always at least equal to norm A. And for at least a couple of cases, we can say it is actually equal to norm A. In particular, for normal matrices, this theorem says that kappa x of A is equal to norm A, um, assuming we, we're using the two norm now. So that's an explicit case where we know the, the condition for the exponential. Uh, another case where we have the same result in a different norm is for stochastic matrices, or multiples of them. It's now the infinity norm where we can say that the condition number is equal to the norm. So those are two important classes of matrices. And so essentially for those classes we know that the exponential is well conditioned. The general question of can you characterize when the exponential is well conditioned is a completely open problem. Um, it's been open for years and nobody's ever really been able to give any deep insight into what it is that makes the exponential ill-conditioned. So uh, that would be, uh, if you have any ideas, that would be uh, well worth pursuing. Uh, but theoretically, I don't think we know a lot more than really is in, in that theorem. So for non-normal matrices, the exponential can be very ill-conditioned, which is the cause of a lot of problems in, um, well, in all sorts of contexts, actually, <coughs> for non-normal matrices. So, if we want to numerically, though, for a given matrix, find the condition number, or just to compute L of F um, directly, there are various things you can do. And one of them is to reduce the problem back to computing F of A. So this is a rather nice result on this slide, I think. 
So it says that if you have this block matrix A E naught A, so this of course is 2n by 2n, so this is a big matrix now, but if you can compute the f of that matrix, then the top right hand corner will have the bit we want. So there's something there, the Fréchet derivative appears in the top right hand corner as the n by n uh, top right hand block. So if you have a method for computing f, you can get the Fréchet derivative by applying your method to a bigger matrix and then just reading off the top right hand corner. Because the problem is that this is now a bigger matrix, so the computational cost will be much higher. But it does have some structure, so you might be able to exploit this block triangular structure and hopefully you won't need to compute twice the diagonal block because that's just f of a and f of a. So you may be able to reduce the, uh, the cost by exploiting those properties. So this, this might be one way you, that you use to compute the Fréchet derivative as long as the, the, the problem's not too large. Um, there is one little uh, caveat here. There's something a bit odd about this expression. You see, the Fréchet derivative is by definition linear in its second argument. It's linear in E. So if I multiply E by alpha, then I can take the alpha out because this is a linear function of E. Okay. So any method for computing LFAE should have this same property. It shouldn't matter what the scale of E is. But in this formula, it probably will matter because E is embedded with A. So if I multiply E by a million, I make the top right-hand corner block bigger compared to the, the diagonal blocks, and that will probably affect the numerical properties of my method. It might make it more accurate or less accurate, probably less accurate. So there's a question about how you should scale E in that formula, which is not, it's not at all obvious how to answer it. But nevertheless, that is a good way of, if you can afford it, getting um, hold of the derivative. And of course, if you just think back to the case where n is 1, this is related to our formula at the start of the lecture. So let's put n is 1. I've now got a little 2 by 2 matrix. And this, this theorem reduces to the following. It says we've got naught f of a, naught f of a, and then we've got the Fréchet derivative um, at a in the direction e, which is just f dash of a times e in the n is 1 case. And uh, this, this is just the formula we had before. This, this derivative here is the divided difference f a a, which becomes a derivative when you have coincident arguments. So um, you can see that that is consistent with our formula for f of a triangular 2 by 2 matrix. Another way of computing derivatives that's very well known is by finite differences. Uh, again, you can think of the scalar case here. If you want to approximate f dash of x, then as we all know, you can just use something like a forward difference. Uh, and this will give you an approximation as long as h is sufficiently small. Um, and as you probably know, how to choose h is a bit of a tricky question because if mathematically we want to take h as small as possible to get a good approximation, but numerically, if we take h too small, we'll get severe cancellation in the top and the accuracy will degrade and so the standard sort of advice is, um, well, if you, plot, if you plot the total error, so if you have here h, and on the y-axis the total error, and so by total error I mean the error due to truncating this effectively Taylor series, plus the error due to round off, you get this u-shape. So uh, as h gets smaller, the error decreases, and in exact arithmetic it would carry on decreasing, but in floating point it starts to increase again, eventually, because of cancellation here. So you have to try and find this point here, this, this point where you're balancing the errors due to truncation with the errors due to round off. And typically that point is something like, uh, something proportional to um, the square root of the unit round off. 
So um, maybe 10 to the minus 8 or so in the IEEE double precision. So you're normally limited to about the square root of the machine precision in how much accuracy you can uh, expect to get by using a finite difference. So what I've just said there is entirely standard. Um, it's in all the textbooks. It applies equally well to the, the scalar case as to the... We could also say the same things about the matrix case. So, so finite differences would be one possible way to approximate the Fréchet derivative. But again with this limitation of about getting half precision. What's on this slide is, um, in a sense, a much better approach. And it's not very well known. However, there is a limitation. This only works if everything is real. So assume now that A is real, E is real, and F is a real function of real matrices. So what I'm doing here, I'm adding on to A, not just a small perturbation matrix of a general form, but something rather special. I, the imaginary unit times H times E. Okay, so I'm going complex here. I'm making the problem complex. Um, so what I've done there is written down the Fréchet derivative uh, relation with instead of E, I've now got I H E. <coughs> and if you take real parts in that expression, um, this term here is entirely complex, or is pure imaginary. So taking real parts will give you this. And taking imaginary parts, and we can now drop the F of A because that's real, taking imaginary parts uh, gives you this relation. Okay, so from that, um, by computing f of a plus this imaginary perturbation, I can get both an approximation to f and an approximation to the Fréchet derivative. Um, and just let me explain a bit more about what's happening there, about why that's um, working. <coughs> so we've basically got an expansion um, going on. So f of x plus i h e can be expanded as f of x plus i h fresher derivative a e. And this is basically the beginning of a sort of Taylor series in uh, Fréchet derivative uh, land. And then the next term will be minus h squared over 2 factorial times some higher Fréchet derivative. And the next term will be i h cubed over 3 factorial times some third Fréchet derivative. And these higher Fréchet derivatives have the form given here, basically dj by dt to the j, f of a plus te at t is naught. And minus dot dot dot. Okay, so it's basically a Taylor series, and if, if you like, just think of the case n is 1, and then all these LFs are just standard derivatives. Um, and because I've got this IH in the, in, the, in the perturbation, when I square it, um, oh, that should just, just, there's no I there, sorry. When I square IH, I get minus H squared. Uh, the cube of that will be IH cubed, and, and so on. So the terms are alternating between real and imaginary. So real, pure imaginary, real, pure imaginary, and so on. And what that tells me is that this second approximation here, where I've taken the imaginary parts of this whole series, will be correct to order h squared, because the first term that's been omitted is this one here. And when you divide by h, this error is order h squared. 
So it's actually an order 8 squared approximation to, um, to the derivative. Which is pretty good. And I don't have to worry about floating point errors anymore. So in this context, I can take h is 10 to the minus 100 uh, with impunity. There'll be no problem with a very tiny h, which sounds a bit hard to believe. Um, you know, why doesn't, if I take h is 10 to the minus 100, why doesn't it just disappear from the computations? It's so small compared with 1. If you did 1 plus that h on the computer, you'd just get 1. Well, that's the remarkable thing about this idea. It's a kind of, sim it's like a sort of poor man's symbolic differentiation. When you program this, the imaginary parts um, are somehow kept separate from the real parts throughout the computation um, and, and don't participate in any serious rounding errors. So it, it does work extremely well. Uh, and I'd be surprised it's not used more often. Uh, there is, however, one little thing to be aware of. I said at the start that everything has to be real. So I need A real, E real, F real. Also, the algorithm that computes F must be real. So you mustn't use a sure decomposition in, when you compute uh, F of A plus I H G, because that would go complex and that would mess up things, that would become unstable. But as long as your algorithm only employs, in principle, real arithmetic, um, this, this will work. So that's, um, that's quite a reasonable method to consider for, uh, for computing derivatives. The, so the method in the scalar case, the earliest reference I found really was, uh, I think, a paper in the 1990s in Sign Review. And since then, there have been several papers picking this idea up. Some people have um, written MATLAB functions to automatically implement this, this algorithm. Some people have extended it to compute higher derivatives in the same way. And in, 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 so this, this idea of doing it for matrix functions was uh, something my former PhD student, um, Awad al Moe and I did. Um, and it, as I say, it does, it does work well, as long as your original algorithm does not require complex arithmetic. So that was a way of approximating the Fréchet derivative itself. If all we want is to know the condition number of the, of the function, all we want is the norm of the Fréchet derivative, and this is a slightly different scenario. So now, we don't necessarily want to compute LF explicitly, but what we do want is to get its norm. So let me describe how we might go about that. The, the key representation, or the key idea, is to note that LF is a linear function of E. So it's linear in any particular element of E. <coughs> so that means that you must be able to write LF somehow or other as E times a vector. Because any linear function of E must have that kind of form, must not it? So, suppose we take the vec of LF and what is vec? Well, if you haven't seen it before, it's a vector matrix you... so let's call the columns A1 to AN. You just put the columns one on top of the other. Alright, so the vec of the matrix, you just stack the columns one on top of each other to get an n squared by one vector. So if we vec LFAE, we now have a vector that's a linear function of E. So it must be writable as something times vec of E. It's a linear function of E so there must be some matrix times vec of E. And that matrix is what we call Ka. Okay. 
So this is just expressing the linearity of the Fresnel derivative. And this matrix is n squared by n squared. This vector is n squared by 1. This is n squared by 1. And this is the Kronecker form. The Kronecker form of the Fresnel derivative. K of A. So it's a big n squared by n squared matrix. OK. So what have we gained by, um, by vecking? Well, it, the point is it's nice to separate out E from this other part. So once we've got E separated out in this way, we can get useful results. Question? Sorry, what is the Kronecker form? Kron well, this is the Kronecker form, K of A. That's just my definition. I'm just going to call this the Kronecker form. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go into chronic theory and say this is an example of that. It's just a, it's just a name for it. Um, and the reason for that name is that sometimes K will have the form of a chronic product. But we, I don't think we're going to need that at all. Okay, so one nice result that comes from this is shown on the slide here. So my claim is that the Frobenius norm of the Fresh derivative is equal to the two norm of k of a. Okay. So the Frobenius norm of the thing we're vecking is equal to the two norm of k of a. And I just suppose we'll just take five minutes. You have a go at proving that, and then I'll I'll do it on the board. So prove what's in yellow using this relation here. So it's not, not too hard, but you, you do have to think about the difference between the, the space of n by n matrices and the space of n squared by n squared matrices and n squared by 1 vectors. So just have a go at proving the yellow box for five minutes, and then we'll, um, I'll do it on the board. And you will need to use the definition um, of you'll need to use the definition of the norm of the Fresnel derivative here. So you need to use this relation here. So if you start with this relation and work from there, and you want to take the Frobenius norm in this relation. Uh, I presume everybody knows what the Frobenius norm is, but I'll just write it up if you don't. The sum of the squares of the elements and the square root of that. Okay, so using the definition of L of A in the case of the Frobenius norm, prove the result in the yellow box.
And uh, the, the key relation you need to use, in case you haven't realized, is that the Frobenius norm of A is the same as the true norm of Vec of A. Okay, well, I'll, I'll now do it on the board. So we start off with LF of A in the Frobenius norm. And the definition is that that's the maximum of non-zero E of LF AE. Okay, so that's the definition from a couple of slides back. And now if we... Um, use the result I just wrote down over there, we can convert the, the true norm by vecking. So I can vec that. So that converts from the Frobenius norm to the true norm. And then I can use the Kronika form in the, in the numerator. So I get K of A times Vec of E. And that last line is used the result um, at the top of the slide. And then this is just the definition of the true norm of kappa A, of K of A. Because Vec E is a completely arbitrary vector, as E is arbitrary. Okay, so that's the true norm of, um, of K of A. So it's just a question of knowing when to flip between um, the Vec, the Vec space and the unvec space. So, so that's, um, and the, the, the significance of that is that now we have a matrix problem. So K of A is just a matrix, it's not an operator. So we can think of methods that we know for estimating matrix norms. And in particular, we're going to use the, um, we're going to use the power method. Um, I'll just come back to the, the bottom part of that slide in a minute. Um, here's a slide I added that's not on the handout. I just thought you might need to recap what the power method is. So the power method is a method for estimating the norm of a matrix. Um, well, no, let me back step a bit. It, the power method is a method for estimating the largest eigenvalue of a matrix. If we apply it to A star A, it will give us an estimate of the largest singular value or, or the two norm. And here's what it looks like when it's written out in all its detail. So we basically just keep multiplying it at the starting vector by A star A. So we first of all multiply by A, then by A star. And if we take the right ratio of uh, norms here, then these gammas will converge to, uh, well, hopefully they will converge to um, the, uh, the actual two norm. So that's the standard power method that you've probably all seen before in lots of different contexts. Uh, to, to implement this, you'll have to normalize somehow because otherwise W and Z could overflow eventually. So you need to scale them back maybe as a unit norm. And uh, we know that the convergence is at best linear, so this is not going to be a very fast converging iteration. But nevertheless, it is a widely used um, method and it's, it's often implicit within other <coughs> algorithms. So I'm, I want to use this with A equal to K of A. Okay, so we'll use the power method to estimate this K of A here. <coughs> so to do that, I need to be able to compute K of A times a vector and K A star times a vector. 
So what is what is k of a all star? And how would I compute k of a times a vector? Well, see, k of a times a vector, to compute k of a times a vector, I can just compute the Fresher derivative at a and the unvec of that vector. So imagine if you give me a vector, I will call that a vec of e, it will have a corresponding e, and so to compute k of a times your vector, I can just compute the Fresher derivative um, in this direction here. So I'm going to write, so I'm thinking of the algorithm that's been um, described in, um, in this space where we're working on a matrix, but whenever I have to actually compute anything, I'm going to come back and work on this um, derivative space here. Um, but the question is, how would I compute the star? And there's a little bit at the bottom of the slide that I'm not going to dwell on, but is, to, to get the star, I need to think about what I'm really doing here. So um, I, I can think of this inner product space on which there's an adjoint, and this is essentially what I need to implement the algorithm. The, so this corresponds to the star in the power method. And that's equal to L F bar A star, where F bar means F of Z bar all barred. So I'm not going to dwell on that as we're running out of time, and it's not so important. In, in most cases of interest, um, F bar is just F, so this um, is unnecessarily complicated. But the basic idea is apply the power method to um, our particular context. So all you have to do is translate each of these products back into some operation with the Fresher derivative. And here's how it looks. So we have a Fresher derivative at A in the direction ZK gives me a new W, and I plug in that W here, and I work out the adjoint of the Fresher derivative to give me my new Z. Uh, and the rest of the algorithm is the same um, as before. So that will give me linear convergence to a, a lower bound, in fact, for the norm of the Fresher derivative. So that is just the standard power method. Um, however, that's not what, what I do in practice. Instead, I use a one-norm a one version of the power method. So the standard power method is in the two-norm. That method is actually a, a special case of a family of methods that work for any p-norm. So if you think of the vector p-norms 1 all the way through to infinity, um, you can actually define a corresponding power method for any value of p. This has been done in the 1970s um, in a long-forgotten paper that um, appeared in LEA. And it turns out that the one-norm version of these power methods has some rather interesting properties. And in particular, it converges very quickly in practice. Um, and often gives you the exact answer. So that's the reason why we use the one norm rather than the two norm. The one norm power method has some very interesting properties from the point of view of matrix uh, norm estimation. And there's a block version of the one norm estimator that I developed with Tissur in 2000, and that in fact is what we actually use. So the algorithm looks rather like the one written down there, um, but instead of k is naught to infinity, it normally takes about four or five iterations of, of the loop to converge. And, and we found that that gives very reliable uh, estimates in practice of the, uh, of the norm. So um, this is routinely what we use for estimating the condition number of, say, the exponential or the logarithm or a power of a matrix or whatever. And so all we need to do to implement the algorithm is have a way of computing the Fresher derivative um, at f. And, well, the adjoint will usually just correspond to the, the same sort of computation. Okay. And that will give us the norm of the Fresher derivative and hence the condition number. Okay. And the other context where you might want the derivative is an optimization. Um, and uh, everything I've said about computing L of, L of, of F would apply uh, there as well in some optimization context, maybe with, a, say, a Newton method or something like that. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop.